the participants are flooding in and somebody's joined us from an from a boardroom. I don't know who those people are, but welcome. Might be us, yeah. Hey, sorry, we joined as a whole team here. <laughs> oh, that's okay. Welcome. Are you are you new to um, to these webinars? Yes, we oh, got well. a rec recommendation today, so that's why we're just <laughs> <laughs> trying this out. Yeah. Yeah, God, who recommended you? I, you? You might want to speak to them later. Well, welcome. We've never had this before. We've been doing this for a very long time. I didn't mean to put you on the spot in your first webinar, but I was thinking, hey, is that a boardroom down there? Um, so so welcome. Okay, so, so to everybody, and at least there's one team that are new to WTF, my name's Jamie Dobson. I am the uh, founder and the chief executive of uh, Container Solutions. And um, I don't have a very good job. It's very stressful, very difficult. However, one of the favorite things I get to do is uh, present at this webinar and at different conferences. And I get to speak about the things that I'm really passionate about. I am joined today by my colleagues from Container Solutions, another Jamie. He's not the he's not the main Jamie. He's the is the second Jamie at Container Solutions because he's down the first one. Uh, joined from by Jamie, by Carla, and Julian. And our special guest today is Johnny Williams. Hi, Johnny. You want to say hello? Hello, indeed. If I can find the mute button, good to be here. Looking forward to talking about delivery management. Brilliant. We can't wait. And we've had quite a lot of people subscribe to this, Johnny, which makes me think it's going to be uh, it's going to be a bit of a good bit of a knockout, really. Um, okay. So for those of you who are new, we don't go straight into the main event, but we do some announcements, and we also have a ses session about industry gossip. I think we first did this a year ago. It was an experiment because we are quite an experiment, experimental uh, company. And it really worked. So people quite liked listening to the gossip and what we think about industry gossip. So Julian's going to be helping with, with me with that today. Um, before we get cracking with that, a little bit of housekeeping. Um, we do have a code of conduct, which we do strictly enforce. One of, the, one of my colleagues now is going to drop that into the chat box. You can take it with you if you're running a conference or an online event and you would like to um, uh, use the code of conduct or tweak it for your own purposes. You know, I, I will summarize it briefly. Be good to each other. Um, um, don't be rotten. But if you want more details, you, you read the code of conduct itself. We are recording this webinar. If you have real objections to this, let us know and we can pixelate you out. Alternatively, you might want to turn your camera off. If for some reason you really don't want to be present on a video recording, which we will later put onto YouTube, I'm afraid we're going to have, have to ask you politely to leave, uh, but then you can watch the video at a later date. So we just wanted to make you aware of that. Now, there's always one thing I forget on housekeeping, Carla. What have I forgot? I've also just activated a transcript uh, so people can actually follow the, the subtitles of the, the talk. Yes. Okay. This is good. So we, yes, that's right. So where possible, we turn the transcript on and at our live events where possible, we, we uh, bring professionals in to help us make these, um, our, our conferences and our webinars more accessible. That means I have to speak clearly because when it's automatic transcription, my Yorkshire accent destroys the software that runs this. So if there are any mistakes in the transcript, it's probably because of the way I speak. So my forgiveness uh, uh, to, to those people. Um, okay, fine. And next up is our announcements. So um, the big announcement is this one. What the F is SRE? So next week we are running this conference in London. It's the 4th and the 5th of May. I'm doing the keynote. I'm looking forward to that. It's going to be a keynote about artificial intelligence, but it's about the lessons we've learned historically and what they might teach us about the mistakes we're currently making with AI. I've never looked into this topic before, so it's been really, really exciting and a bit stressful process for me, but I've enjoyed creating this talk. I think, Johnny, are you speaking too next week? Uh, unfortunately, I can't make it, but a few of my colleagues from Red Hat will be there talking about some really interesting stuff to do with platform as a product. Very cool. I look forward to that. Actually, yeah. I don't if I don't know if anybody can share the schedule right now in the chat. The, the, I honestly think the agenda is one of the best agendas we've ever, ever put together. So I'm really proud about that. And I think it's testament to the community that we've built around uh, WTF that so many brilliant speakers want to come. A um, couple of things. If you've been recently made redundant, obviously, we're very sorry for that. It is not nice out there right now. Uh, all kinds of uh, cutbacks. Uh, difficult economic conditions, high cost of living for, for many people, many people who are worse off than the type of people who work in technology. 
Um, so we do have free tickets for anybody who has been recently affected by changes in the economy. Let us know in a direct message or send an email to events at containersolutions.com and we will sort you a ticket out if possible, if we've got enough left, but I, th I think we probably will be. Um, we also have a last minute two for one offer on tickets for the same reasons, uh, because basically nobody's spending money right now on conferences. So if you work at a place or if you're a freelancer and you want to grab a ticket and bring a friend, that, then that offer's open as well. Um, anything else about the conference next week, Carla or Jamie? So no. it's, it's in London. I don't think we've got any weird mask restrictions or anything like that. Um, we are recommending people to to be careful if they are feeling not well, obviously, to, to either wear a mask or, you know. That's true. Yeah, that's a very polite way of saying, do not turn up to that fucking conference if you've got COVID, okay? Right, yes. give me your money back. Don't Just don't turn up or give me it. Okay, <laughs> fine. So please be sensible, travel safely and keep safe. Um, right now, oh, I wrote a book. That was good. It's not as good as Johnny's book, uh, although it is far superior as a book at sending people to sleep. So if you're struggling from insomnia, what you've got to do is open up the Cloud Native Transformations book and read a few of the patterns, Oof, you'll be gone like that. However, that being said, it is very popular uh, with people who move into the cloud because it's very practical. It's not a book you read cover, cover to cover. It's a, it's a reference book full of patterns. Last week at KubeCon, and I was very grateful for this, a team from ING Bank in the Netherlands gave a great talk about how they moved to the cloud, how they took care of security, et cetera, et cetera. And they said something along the lines of, we use lots of patterns from this book, uh, but they wish they'd have had the book when they started the process a few years ago. So it really does get used heavily in industry. I'm very proud of that. Um, if you want to grab a free copy, um, because we can't sell it anymore, basically. No, seriously, <laughs> if you want to get a free copy, go to the website right now and you can, you can download a copy uh, alternatively, you can buy a copy from uh, Amazon. I think it's about 30 or 40 quid. Um, of course, you can sign up to our newsletter by scanning the QR code or clicking on this link later when you get the deck. The newsletter has always been quite regular. We're actually taking a small pause in the next month or two as we figure out what to do with the newsletter. Um, it's not about container solutions, it's pure content. We're wondering, should it be more about us? What direction should it take? And as a newsletter, it's very labor intensive, it, as are all the events that we do. So we just want to take stock of where we are, what people like, what people want from us moving forward. And then as we get closer to the summer, fingers crossed, we pull the trigger and WTF starts to go back into print again. Um, anything else about on the newsletter, Carla? Uh, and we know it's popular, we know people love it, so it's not going away, but we yeah. as a company just need to figure out uh, what we're doing next with it. Basically, it's, it, it's way more successful than we imagined. So now, now we have to figure out what the evolution of WTF looks like. Uh, and on that happy note, I'm going to bring in, oh no, the slides didn't update. Wait a minute, I'm just going to come out of full screen because some vandal destroyed my slides by using weird fonts. Um, so I quickly put the gossip slides back together and now, I'm very, very happy to invite my favorite Swiss colleague, Julian. <laughs> he's the only Swiss person in the company. Uh, so he's, my, he's both my favorite and least favorite Swiss colleague uh, to come in and, and tell us what's happening. Julian. Great, thanks a lot, Jamie. So today I will talk to you, uh, we talk about Elastic, first about Elastic, which contributes now ECS to Hotel. So what I mean by this, I don't know if you've ever heard of ECS. Yeah. It's Elastic Common Schema. And it's actually something that Elastic has been open sourcing to simplify the way you can integrate, um, use different uh, measures that you would have from your infrastructure. So if you've ever tried to do deep observability or security, you know that, that that's always an issue to parse logs, to know which what goes where, which values goes where, and to try to um, centralize all this and make sense of all this. It's quite hard. So Elastic, uh, the company provided the ECS as a way to do that. It was well received, but there was a problem. There was open telemetry on the other side, which was very successful. So it's very nice that now they actually, uh, Elastic is going with open telemetry to actually have um, 
something that is unified and avoid to have two separate things um, competing with each other. So this is very nice for observability and security in the tech world. Um, as a second gossip, ChatGPT unreliable output. So I don't know if you've heard of ChatGPT. I, I, I guess so, if you've not been under a rock for the past three weeks. Um, something that we're beginning to see is that while we all beginning, we all begin to trust it more and more, it can also, we still need to be very careful because it can, it can also give unreliable output. Not so long ago, um, there was a person, for example, received a, a low professor, received a text message from someone asking if he actually had ever sexually harassed someone. And it turned out it was a complete hallucination from ChatGPT when asked a question about uh, this topic. So we can imagine that it can have dramatic consequences. I mean, I've never heard of that, a computer program giving unreliable output. Well, I never. Who would have thought of it? And by the way, don't trust artificial intelligence. Are you all mad? At KubeCon, like seriously, don't trust computers. They're going to kill us all. So at KubeCon last week, there was one of those dogs from that robot company. What's the name of that company? Is it Boston Dynamics? It's Boston Dynamics, yeah. And the dog's jumping around like a real dog and everybody's going, oh, look at this dog, look at this dog. Seriously, they're going to put a gun on it and it's going to chase people around cities. Uh, right? They already put a gun on it. Oh, there, there are you a go. few companies who did that. So, so you cannot trust you cannot trust artificial intelligence. Please don't be foolish. Um, but that that's shocking. I feel sorry for the law professor. That sort of sucks. That's a hell of an accusation. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, this was about that. There is also a small. Uh, you will find a link about um, a video from uh, also live overflow because this can happen in an in a way that was not uh, made by anyone, but. Live Overflow, who's a very um, famous cyber secu security specialist, showed that you can actually pack a prompt, kind of bamboozle it, to manage to manipulate the output. So that's all, also something about trust in outputs of AI. And then, so kind of a similar uh, topic, but there's a new TED talk from the OpenAI co-founder, Greg Brockman. So it's fantastic. Go watch it. He's talking about uh, ChatGPT, where it came from, and especially where it's yeah. going. And he, he's showing all the plugin yeah. stuff that's going to come out very soon, um, which will allow to integrate different things together. So, for example, create um, create tweets automatically depending on some stuff or um, browse the internet to have references uh, also and everything with uh, a lot of sourcing in the output so this is really nice and it's a very exciting talk and there is a very nice interview afterwards that is also worth checking I was trying to find, so I was reading a book called The Chip, and I wanted to know which where a specific page number was. So I asked Chat GPT because I thought, I wonder if it knows where this passage is in this book because I can't remember. And it took me ages. I kept asking it questions and it kept giving me reasonable answers. But then all of a sudden I was thinking, I don't think it knows what it's talking about. So I said to it, have you actually read this book? And it said no. And I was like, maybe you should have said that at the beginning of this conversation. That being said, that being said, I follow Kent Beck on Twitter. He was an extreme programmer. I was once upon a time an extreme programmer. And he said 90% of his skills have just been made redundant. But the other 10%, the, the judgment part of his mind, where he, he, can, he can assess what good code and bad code look like, all of a sudden is much more valuable. Now, I haven't programmed Java for a very long time. But yesterday, I couldn't help it. I was up early. And I basically started, I, I told ChatGPT, these are the design principles that I want you to use. And I asked it to calculate, or working with it, I built a table, uh, an interactive league table for football and rugby scores. I did it in about 20 minutes. And, and then it used getters. And I said, what are you using getters for? I just told you in the beginning, don't, don't expose data. And it said, oh, sorry, my bad. Yeah, you're right. That's not a good design principle. 
And I was thinking, how stupid are you? But then I realized, how bad am I? How impatient am I as a teacher? But then I remembered, they're not real people. They're computer programs. And, and that thing last week at KubeCon was not a real dog. Anyway, so it, it, it is phenomenal. It is really phenomenal. And I'm, I'm, I was very dismissive for the last few weeks and still I, until I started writing my talk for next week. And actually, it's very interesting because the telegraph and the telephone and the computer all had human supervisors until the day they didn't. And right now, AI has got human supervisors. Pretty soon, we're going to be in the way. Uh, so it's all very exciting stuff. So I'm going to watch that TED Talk, Julian. And I think that gossip has been fantastic today. So thank you. Thank you. On that note, I will now turn it down, the volume on my chatter. I will not interrupt Johnny like I interrupted Julian. Uh, but I will hand over now to the main event. So I'd like everybody to join me in giving a, a warm welcome to Johnny Williams, who's written an awesome book about delivery management. And I never told him this, actually, but we're using a lot of the principles. So I basically convinced him to give this talk so that we could get a bit of free teaching. So, so we <laughs> this stuff internally. It, it's awesome. Uh, Johnny, welcome. Amazing. Thank you so much. And uh, very interesting gossip as well. Very good to hear. Um, I'm going to just hop across and start sharing my screen if it wants to cooperate. So give me a shout if you can or can't see the screen. All good, amazing. So we're here today to talk about the very interesting topic of what is delivery management. And uh, I think the obvious answer is obviously it's a book. So I think we can probably wrap up there. If you've got any questions, let me know and uh, I'll see you next time. But no, in all seriousness, what is delivery management other than a book? Uh, there's a load of different perspectives that exist out there around delivery management uh, as a title around a discipline it is something that people have very mixed feelings about but i'm hopefully here today to convince you a little bit that delivery management could be a good fit for your organization and actually will be valuable even if you don't love the words that are involved in naming the discipline so delivery management is more than a book and the book itself has plenty of different ideas in it as well that point to what the fuck is delivery management so my definition of delivery management kind of started with gov.uk. So I was a bit of a fanboy with gov.uk when all of the stuff around the government digital service in the UK was emerging and all of the services that the UK government owned and operated were being acknowledged as being a bit rubbish. And there was this massive shift to try and say things could be better. And part of this shift involved looking at the disciplines and the different responsibilities that lived within teams. And one of those things was the role of a delivery manager. Now, when I talk about delivery management, it's much more aligned with the idea of a set of responsibilities or accountabilities within a discipline. It isn't purely a role, but I think this idea of what is a delivery manager really started with gov.uk, for me personally, at least. It's something that had existed out in the wild, but it was where I first learned about it. And so gov.uk talks about a number of different facets when it comes to delivery management and the disciplines and factors that are involved. So whether it's agile and lean practices or financial management or making a process work and certainly team dynamics and collaboration, there's a number of things that this gov.uk definition kind of calls attention to. Um, but for me, that didn't really cut through to the heart of what delivery management really involves. So for reference, I was working for a couple of years at the Department for Work and Pensions as a delivery manager. So I was working in the platform space, actually looking at cloud adoption and thinking about Kubernetes and working with teams that were looking at platforms, whilst also as a sideline and due to a little thing called COVID-19, working to support other government services. So I was very fortunate to work on quite an impactful service during the course of the pandemic called Tell Us Once. And that service enables people to effectively report a death in their family one time and it spreads the message out to local authorities to different parts of government and saves people in the worst part of their life having to basically go through the rigmarole of loads of government bureaucracy so i was supporting the platforms and the cloud aspect of that service and thinking about this definition on gov.uk doesn't really cut through to many of the positives that i experienced working in that delivery management space so i looked a little bit further when i was thinking about what is delivery management I got super curious, was trying to find all sorts of definitions, and realistically, there is not much out there. There's a good few things about sort of the government context, but there aren't that many people that have really talked about delivery management all that much. 
One of the key people that I turned my attention to was Emily Weber. So Emily was the head of agile delivery at GDS, Government Digital Service. So as you can imagine, really core to that kind of key definition that exists online that gov.uk produced. Um, and Emily talks about delivery management from a really positive angle, which uh, you can probably see the connection through to my book for anyone who's read it. This idea of enabling a team to deliver value, but also thinking about the environment, self-organization and culture especially that culture of learning and transparency. So all of those things really stood out to me when I was thinking about Emily's definition from her pretty seminal blog post that she wrote a good few years ago now. And uh, this is something of a reference point that many of us working in government have referred back to. But you might also know that I currently work for a company called Red Hat. So at Red Hat, I work with customers to help them adopt technology, change their ways of working and think about the approach they're using to actually use this really awesome tech. But I'm very much minded towards the idea that we think about people, process and then technology, doing things in that order for a key reason. So there's some really good stuff that Emily's highlighted in her blog post here. But I was thinking, well, there's a little bit more to this as well. There's, there's something that must relate as well to what that value looks like or thinking about actually how this relates to product teams. So the next person I turned to was Marty Kagan. So you might have come across Marty Kagan if you're interested in product management or product delivery. So Marty is part of Silicon Valley Product Group. He's got experience of working with massive companies like eBay. Um, but his book Inspired it was really actually inspirational, no pun intended, for when I was thinking about delivery management as well, because I was tying a lot of my experience and ideas about delivery management, not just to the public sector definition, but also to what this might mean in a product context. So Marty talks about this idea that a delivery manager is there to help get things done. And uh, there's some alignment here that you can probably see in terms of project management or program management, but we'll get onto that a little bit further in a minute or two. But for me personally, this idea that delivery managers there to help get things done was really important. Marty talks a lot about this idea of helping teams to remove impediments. And I think that was a really key theme that I really latched onto and thought, well, you know what, actually, in terms of helping teams deliver value, there's something there, getting the blockers out of the way, making sure that we can actually be effective, get stuff done, basically. So boiling it all down and looking past this kind of high level gov definition, for me, it all really ties into team enablement. The other stuff is more of the details that yes, you might have to encounter, but a lot of those things like financial management or making a process work really tie into that idea of removing impediments or actually enabling the team to be effective and building out that culture where the team can have the impact that they want to have. So in my mind, team enablement is probably the best way of boiling all of this stuff down and making it simple, especially when we're trying to answer that question, what is delivery management? So in the book, I talk about these three aspects of enablement, and this is kind of the expansion on team enablement. When I'm thinking about what it means to be an enabler, for me, that involves being an impediment remover, being a facilitator, being a coach. Now, this can take different forms. There is no singular definition of what it means to be that impediment remover, be that facilitator, be that coach. But these three aspects of enablement, I think, are the core of delivery management. So you can really think about delivery management through these three different lenses, all focused in by being an enabler. Now, what do we mean when we talk about these three different aspects of enablement? Well, removing impediments for me is just making sure that teams can actually crack on, much like what Marty talks about in his book. It's ensuring that actually they're not going to be blocked. They can focus on delivering value. They can be effective, most importantly. And effectiveness is a really key word in terms of the approach that we're looking at here. We're not thinking about efficiency. We're thinking about effectiveness. And those impediments can limit effectiveness and limit value delivery. In terms of facilitation, um, when I think about facilitation, it isn't just about posting notes and putting stuff up on whiteboards, which I love doing, but it is more about making decisions and defining a course of action where people can actually align around the steps they want to take and agree on what they're going to do to make value a reality. So spending time with groups of people, getting people to the point where they actually know what they're going to do next and ensuring that they can really focus on what's going to be valuable. And then the final ingredient, coaching. So for me, this is all about supporting other people to maximize their potential. And that definition aligns a little bit with the idea of life coaching or professional coaching. But when we think about coaching in the delivery management context, we're not really trying to do that. We're not trying to help people with their personal life problems. It's all about that context of the team and thinking about how to help them be more effective from that enablement standpoint. But we still want to help them maximize their potential and we still want to help them find ways to basically fulfill that potential by self-organizing. 
So if everyone is being fully directed or being told exactly what to do, they're probably not going to fulfill the potential that they have. Of course, there's significant overlap between all of these different ideas as well. So you might remove impediments by coaching people or you might coach people in the context of facilitation that when you're running a workshop, you help to expose new ideas that they might want to learn more about or help them to uncover their own potential of how they can solve a problem without your intervention effectively. So for me, there is definite overlap, which is why that diagram of the three different aspects does cut across. It isn't something where they're completely siloed disciplines, a bit more like this visual here. So I think equally it's worth acknowledging that when it comes to removing impediments, facilitation and coaching, all of them can help build each other in the right direction as well. So when we talk about removing impediments, if you're always the person in a team that is removing impediments for others, you're probably not being very effective as a coach. Arguably, the main impediment to remove in a team is a team's lack of ability to remove impediments. And once you get them over that hurdle, you can probably zone in a little bit more on helping them to maximize their potential in other areas. So that for me is what delivery management looks like at a high level, um, but it goes a little bit further. And this is one of the reasons I wanna tap into this idea of delivery management being essentially project management. I personally think there's a fair bit of difference. Um, and I think it would be very simple to say, we take the three aspects of enablement and bolt it onto project management. But in my experience, it does not look like that. There is significant difference in my experience between project management and delivery management. And although there's gonna be some overlap in terms of the tools or maybe aspects of the things that they do day to day, I think there is significant enough difference that we should call attention to it. And arguably, Bit of a tip, if you are looking to talk to someone who's working in that delivery management space, you probably don't want to just call them a project manager because sometimes it doesn't land all that well. In all seriousness, though, it's not something which should be a real issue because the real thing is about the discipline as opposed to the job title. So project management as a discipline still has value. It's just that it might not be the predominant approach that we take if we also want to apply delivery management. So. Realistically, project management kind of answers this question instead. What isn't delivery management? It's not really project management. It's something distinct. It's something different. I refer back quite frequently to Alan Kelly. I actually had a brief chat with Alan Kelly on LinkedIn um, where he said thank you for boosting sales of his book because he'd seen Project Myopia get a bit of a boost recently. And that's partly, I hope, because I keep talking about it. So if I have helped out Alan Kelly's book sales, then I'll be very happy. Um, it's a book I refer to frequently where Alan talks about why agile models and project models don't sit together all that well. Now, delivery management isn't explicitly an agile discipline, although it does focus in on those ideas around incremental and iterative work. And we're thinking about self-organizing teams. So there's going to be something in there that aligns very closely with agile and lean approaches. Um, however, Alan Kelly is talking about projects and thinking about why projects don't quite fit with these ways of working is really important to help understand where these distinctions live. So thinking about that question, what isn't delivery management? Well, projects kind of constrain the work in order to control it. And I think that is something that delivery management does not do. We're not looking to constrain people. We're not looking to control people. And the reason for this is because of the fact that work and people are complex. So if we're working in this emergent fashion where we're trying to uncover new ideas and drive innovation, we don't want to constrain the ideas that people might have. We don't want to limit them. And that's one of the key reasons why we try and work in a way which is open to flexible and adaptable approaches, as opposed to creating that big Gantt chart or roadmap of doom with fixed milestones that actually mean we have to deliver something, even if it's not going to end up being value, valuable. Value is the key focus, and that's one of the most important reasons why we're not going to try and constrain and control the work. Really, when we think about the toolbox that we might use within the delivery management space, we're thinking about aspects of project management that could be valuable, but we're not trying to be project managers. So we might think about risk and create something like a raid log, but we're not going to tell the team how to work. We're not going to give them deadlines that they have to operate to. And we're not going to limit something or disguise a blocker or a problem just because it doesn't fit within the paradigm of project management that people might think about. Instead, we're going to work in an open way that is going to be better aligned with those three aspects of enablement, facilitation, coaching and removing impediments. So for me personally, command and control delivery management is worthless. It does not fit the intent behind delivery management. If we're working in this command and control way where we're being dictatorial or we're trying to define timelines for people, it just doesn't make sense. How can we facilitate? How can we coach? How can we truly remove impediments if we're controlling and constraining the work? 
if anything as well, it's worth considering the fact that actually this kind of command and control delivery management is worth less as well. If we've hired people to be enablers, then why would we try and push them to deliver in a way that's aligned with command and control? You're not getting value for money if you're using people in this way. You're also not going to get value for money out of teams. If you're trying to constrain ideas, if you're trying to limit innovation, then what's the point in having a really smart bunch of people in the room? So delivery management should actually open up the conversation, enable experimentation and support that self-organization that really helps value to emerge. For me, this all filters into the idea of enabling teams rather than controlling teams. It's a very simple principle. And when we think about delivery management, it's all about enablement. It's not about management in that traditional sense. When we talk about delivery management, the managing part is more about the context that we manage or the circumstances that we manage or the impediments that we try and manage. It isn't about being a traditional manager. It's not about being that people manager, let's say. A similar discipline might be product management. And when we talk about product management, it's relating to the product. We're not thinking about managing the people. So when we're talking about teams, this is a really key question that I get asked quite frequently. So what types of teams are we really thinking about here? Because there's plenty of different teams out there. I'll be talking about a finance team, HR team, football team, rugby team, um, a team that might be on Jamie's chart that he's designed with ChatGPT. Who knows? Um, well, for me, I like to come back to the Werner Vogels thinking about build it, run it teams. And this is something that really feeds into this idea of cloud native development or thinking about DevOps and really these effective teams that own what they're working on. And I like this idea because Werner actually calls out the fact that the teams became more effective and the quality of the products improved. As soon as they were responsible for running what they built, they actually increased the effectiveness of what they were doing. And this is something that I call out because I think realistically, when we're talking about teams, we want them to be building and running and solving their own problems, being these long lived, cross functional, properly sized, highly aligned, empowered teams. When I say enabling teams, all that stuff in the middle, the filling of the sandwich, it kind of goes without saying. But a lot of the time in organizations, we have to make this explicit. We want long lived teams so that they can own the things that they build, so that they can fix the problems when something arises rather than trying to chuck it over the wall to someone else. We want them to be cross-functional. So you've not got these functional silos of a dev team working on something, handing it off to a build team, handing it off to someone who's deploying it, and then handing over to a test function or however the organization's working. We want all of that good stuff in one team so they can collaborate and actually ensure the solution is gonna be valuable. Properly sized, because if anyone has ever worked in a team of 50 people, you realize it's very hard to get stuff done effectively because you're reliant on other people, dependencies are higher, you can't communicate effectively. So sizing a team properly. And then alignment and empowerment are really key things. I'm a firm believer that you can't empower others, but you can make them feel empowered. And I think that alignment is really key as well. So they've got a vision they can work towards. And I think this is the kind of team that we're talking about, where they've got ownership around a vision, where they've got direction that they're working towards, where they know what they're aiming to do and the outcomes they're trying to achieve. And all of this aligns around value. And that's the key thing. What's the point in having a team if they're not doing something valuable? So we've kind of answered another question, but maybe not answered what is delivery management. That whole definition there really nails to me what a product team is. And when we think about product teams, it's a really key idea. Even if we think about platforms as well, I like to advocate this idea of platform as a product and therefore your platform team should be a product team as well. But you should know based on that short definition what a product team is but maybe you're still a little bit loose on what a delivery management definition should be so value is the word that i keep coming back to and if we're trying to answer the question what is delivery management then value is probably the key concept that we have to focus in on so i really like this idea from the book sooner safer happier sooner safer happier is a fantastic read it's something i reference quite a lot in my own book um, but this model that Jonathan Smart's pulled together of having a value outcome lead, a team outcome lead, and an architecture outcome lead, all supporting the team as enablers, aligns really nicely with the idea of delivery management. And it's something I come back to. So if we're focused on value, then we want to have these enablers that support the team to function in that way, where they are highly aligned, where they've got high psychological safety, and where they've got that vision that they're working towards. So your value outcome lead might be someone like a product manager, architecture outcome lead might be someone like a tech lead or an architect. And your team outcome lead for me could be someone like an agile coach, could be someone like a scrum master, but really it could be that person who's a delivery manager, someone applying delivery management who can work in that capacity to help the team get to the point where their system of work enables value delivery. 
Team outcome enablement is probably the other way that we should describe delivery management. We're helping the teams get to the point of valuable outcomes. Now, I also really like this model out of Sooner Safer Happier, where we think about how these different teams can collaborate and how that stacks up as well. Because value isn't something that happens in isolation in our organizations. It is something that requires us to have an understanding of value streams, or at the very least, these kind of end-to-end -end customer journeys. And all of this stuff is likely to live on top of platforms or to use other tooling that exists elsewhere, but it should be the kind of sum total of the vision and values that we're trying to build together to deliver something that's actually useful. And for me, this idea of having these different enablers really functions across organizations. The team is the hub, the team is the vehicle of value delivery, but then when you scale it up and think about teams collaborating together as part of value streams or within different domains, it's all of that cumulative effort that really leads to valuable outcomes. So this model from Sooner, Safer, Happier is a really good way of thinking about delivery via value streams or thinking about those long lived products with long lived teams that are collaborating to make sure that good stuff is happening in the organization. Valuable outcomes are the entire purpose behind delivery management and arguably should be the entire purpose behind the teams that you are in or the teams that you're trying to stand up. If they're not achieving valuable outcomes, there's no point. And that aligns with the idea that command and control delivery management isn't effective because it can constrain value. It aligns with the idea that chucking stuff over the fence between delivery or development and operations just doesn't make sense because again, you're constraining long lived value. Realistically, if you're not focused on value, you're probably not applying delivery management in the right way. So thrown around a lot of words and I still feel like maybe you might be a bit confused about what exactly is delivery management. So we've got products and teams and delivery and enablement and outcomes and value, but what is delivery management? If we boil it all down, it comes back to these three aspects of enablement once again. If we think about all of these concepts of helping teams, that's directly aligned with coaching. If we think about value, we really want to ensure that we facilitate the conversations that help people focus on how they're going to get there. And if we think about all of those aspects boiled together, we need to make sure that teams aren't going to be blocked on the pathway to delivery. It's all about the toolbox that you actually pull in to make those aspects of enablement a reality and ensure that those product teams function effectively within the value streams and that you're applying the right practices to ensure that actually you're helping people get to the point of value delivery. So for me, one of the things in my toolbox that I go back to really frequently is this place called the Open Practice Library. The Open Practice Library is a really good resource to use. It contains lots of different tools that you can apply focused on discovery, options, delivery, and foundation. And this is a really key point when I talk about the Open Practice Library because this has got delivery on it identified as part of a process. So when we think about delivery management, are we thinking about this part of the Mobius loop? Are we thinking about a phase that comes after discovery? Well, I would argue, no, it's really important that we tack on the word value in front of delivery management, because when we think about delivery management, it's all about value delivery. It's not about delivery as a phase or an aspect of what we're doing. It's the whole thing. It's more holistic. But the open practice library is one of those foundational things that I have in my toolbox because it's got all of these different resources for things that I can bring to teams, bring to customers, bring to the leaders that I work with. For me personally, I'm very fortunate to work with a lot of very interesting people, including chief technology officers or chief product officers. And actually having these tools in the toolbox enables me to be more effective when I try and apply the discipline of delivery management, especially when it comes to facilitation. So three examples from the open practice library I just wanted to call out. Start at the end, which is one of the most effective goal setting tools that I've ever used. Retrospectives, which I think provide the beating heart of any effective team and enable them to continuously improve. And also using that double diamond from design thinking. So having that tool that enables you to take ideas apart, then bring them back together and then plan out that next course of action. So having tools like this in your toolbox is one of the most important aspects of being effective when you're trying to use delivery management. Delivery management isn't just kind of sitting back and observing. It's also bringing these things to the team and making sure that they can be more effective. There's also a whole host of resources, plug my own book on this list, but these are some of the books that I would say influence the discipline of delivery management most closely. So thinking about books like Marty Kagan's Inspired that help you understand what good product working looks like, thinking about agile coaching, but also books like Turn the Ship Around that really help us understand what good, true leadership that functions as a servant leader could look like creating that culture of leaders where everyone can be a leader, everyone can step up. 
So all of these books are reference points that I've used to try and inform my perspective on delivery management and especially think about the ways of working that are really going to help a team to deliver value and be most effective. So we're kind of looking at that big cocktail of lots of different ideas that inform the approaches that you want to bring to a team. Not only that toolbox of different practices, but also the concepts and ideas that could help a team to ensure they're being effective and staying focused on value delivery. And I was very fortunate in the process of writing and publishing my book to uh, get a quote from Jim Whitehurst, who was the former CEO of Red Hat and also former president of IBM. And Jim kind of summarized what I was trying to talk about in my book better than I had done throughout the entire process of writing. So he really focused in on the fact that great leadership isn't about command and control. It's about creating the context for people to do their best work. And for me, this is what delivery management is all about. So although I covered this topic a bit in my book, I say a bit, it was kind of the core focus of the entire book. Um, realistically, this is what delivery management as a discipline is focused in on. It's about creating a context for people to do their best work. And people that apply delivery management effectively are being those leaders that ensure that people can make those ideas a reality. They're being leaders who ensure that other people can do great things and that that magic of being in a really high performing team becomes a reality. I know that's something that I experienced working in DWP, working at Homes England, working in higher education and now working in Red Hat. It's all about that magic of people collaborating to make amazing things happen and get stuff done. So I don't know for any of you, but certainly for myself, finding any way that I could to help people get to that point was one of the most important things. And that is what delivery management is all about. So moving on to another question that is tied into what is delivery management? Well, who is a delivery manager? And I did rack my brain a bit about this whilst I was pulling together this presentation. There's not really an answer. There's not a clear, simple answer. So maybe we could say, don't ask me, but uh, I, I think again, it comes back to these three aspects of enablement. So anyone who's being that impediment remover, being a facilitator, being a coach, well, you could call yourself a delivery manager if you really want to, but I'm not sure it really matters that much. You don't need to be a delivery manager to apply delivery management. If your job title is agile coach, if your job title is engineering manager, if your job title is project manager, you could still apply delivery management. And I would hope that it would make sure that you could be more effective, that you could do your job in a better way and that you could enable the people around you to do what they're trying to do and deliver value. So you don't need to be a delivery manager to apply delivery management. For me personally, disciplines are 10 times more important than roles. Roles that we carry around are just those name badges or the things that we whack up on LinkedIn. They're kind of useful for orienting in an organization, but they are nowhere near as important as the disciplines that we apply. And with disciplines comes mindset, comes approach, comes ways of working. So the disciplines that we use are much more important than the roles that we carry around with us. If you're trying to start using delivery management, and if you're trying to think about who that person might be in the organization who is gonna be able to apply the discipline, you might actually start thinking, well, should we be looking for a team outcome lead? If the job title doesn't matter that much, if the role doesn't matter that much, maybe what we want is a team outcome lead, someone who's going to enable value, valuable outcomes. Well, if you reach out and say, we're looking for a team outcome lead, you'll probably hear crickets. And equally, if you position it as looking for a value delivery enabler, again, people might not quite catch on. You'll probably hear crickets. So for me, the job title of delivery manager isn't the worst thing. It's not perfect, doesn't always do the job, and people don't always love it. But if you are trying to start applying this discipline, then it might not be the worst thing to seek a delivery manager, so long as you're explicit about that person being there to enable valuable outcomes, and really following along with this idea of the three aspects of enablement. Because the worst thing that you could do is be looking for someone who's going to enable valuable outcomes, put out a job advert looking for a delivery manager, and you end up with someone who's actually going to take that more traditional command and control approach. So it's more about describing the discipline, the way that you want it to be applied, and then probably using the job title as a bit of a hook, as opposed to leading with the job title and presuming that everyone will know that what you want is that team enabler. For me, if you describe it in the right way, if you're looking at the focus on the disciplines, and if you're talking about valuable outcome enablement, as opposed to being purely focused on delivery, especially around timelines or efficiency, or anything that's gonna block potentially the focus on value delivery, you're going to be successful and that is the key thing that you need if you want to start using delivery management in the organization is finding the right person who can apply the discipline fully as opposed to finding the person with the right job title job title is just there to help you it's not going to be the thing that solves all your problems 
The key thing here is that you should understand before you enable, both in, try, in terms of trying to apply delivery management in the organization, but also for you as potentially an individual. So if you want to start using delivery management, then I think it's really important that you understand context, that you understand what it is you're trying to do and why. Context matters more than almost anything else when it comes to delivery management. So I've seen delivery management and these three aspects of enablement being applied in lots of different environments. I've worked with software teams where delivery management really helped out. I've worked with content teams where delivery management helped out. I've even seen behavioral science teams, maybe not ones with uh, <laughs> all this lab equipment, but I've certainly seen behavioral science teams working with delivery managers to make amazing stuff happen. The truth is that you can apply these three aspects of enablement in almost any context. It's all about the way that you apply them though and ensuring that you understand what things might work and what things won't work. There's no point rocking up to a content team and trying to talk about all of the different test-driven development tools that you might recommend, but you might be able to recommend some approaches around Kanban or thinking about how visualizing the work and applying systems thinking could help them to remove impediments. Equally, if you're thinking about that behavioral science team, then you might not want to harp on too much about some of the coaching approaches aligned too closely with Agile if actually what they're doing is really deep research. But it's not to say that you can't coach them in other ways of working that might help them out and actually get you to the point of being that trusted advisor where you are able to enable them. And when we think about scaling this approach out, so I'm talking about different teams here that could be using delivery management and benefiting from that kind of tree and verity model that is talked about in Sooner, Safer, Happier, where you have three types of enablement that might help out a team. The real key thing is to experiment before you scale. Now, scaling is a bit of a dirty world in our world, um, but when you think about the word of scaling, it's really focused on ensuring that you can do the same thing and repeat it and get to the point where something is useful across an organization. This is very true when we think about cloud adoption or where we think about teams that are trying to move to different ways of working that are aligned with contemporary technologies. Really, it's important that you find out what works for you, what works in the right context and understand that context so fully that you can try new things and experiment without worrying that you're overcommitting or getting too deep into something. So I like this idea of deploying delivery management or applying these three aspects of enablement with one team first and then building out from there. So to build on this model in Sooner, Safer, Happier with the value streams and thinking about how value stacks up and can accumulate something really powerful that actually is the results of an entire organization. If you want to start using delivery management, find that one team with the enthusiasts who actually think they could benefit from enablement, who are getting blocks, who can see that they've got impediments and they need some facilitation, they need some coaching. That's the place to try it with. That's the place to figure out whether this discipline could actually be valuable for them. Once you've tried it there, then the most important thing is to just keep experimenting. Don't have to overcommit and it can look different with these different teams, but across value streams, you can have someone who's actually working in that kind of lead delivery management capacity, where they think about enablement for the entire value stream, or you can boil it down to specific products and have people acting as enablers for the product itself. But even if it's just one team that has got someone using delivery management or applying the ideas that I've talked about in my book, hopefully that one team will benefit and it might just start a fire that then spreads across an entire organization to ensure that everyone can be more effective and that everyone can deliver value more effectively. So for me, in summary, that's delivery management. It's all about applying those three aspects of enablement, making sure that people are focused around value, creating this alignment around a vision and ideas to ensure that people can be as effective as possible and that people can achieve valuable outcomes. I do always like to end as well on a bit of a thank you to anyone who has already bought the book. I just want to say a massive thanks for all of the support that you've shown because it's enabled me to have this awesome platform to share new ideas with lots of different people. Um, and the thing that I never expected as well when talking or thinking about delivery management was that it would actually gain so much attention. So not only have you given me a really amazing platform to talk about awesome ideas and hopefully enable teams to deliver value, but it has also enabled me to get a silly amount of Amazon accolades, which has just been ridiculous. So a huge thank you to everyone who supported the book, but hopefully you feel like you've got a clearer picture of what delivery management is now and how you can use it, whether you're a delivery manager or whether you are anyone else in the organization from CTO all the way through to admin assistant. I hope that you'll find some value in delivery management. And uh, yeah, if you want to learn more, then I've got a landing page, deliverValue.uk slash engage, where you can reach out, talk to me. Um, or if you just want to find out more about the book, then deliverValue.uk is the place for that. Equally as well, I've got a bunch of t-shirts up there that uh, fairly vintage styles, cracking jokes about what good delivery might look like for you.
So I'll wrap up there and stop sharing my screen. And uh, yeah, I look forward to answering questions about delivery management and what that might mean in your context. Cool. Let's see if I can. Thank you very, here. thank you very much for that, Johnny. Um, you can post your questions in the chat. However, we've already got a few questions coming in, which I can I can get to straight away. Um, okay, you're going to love this one. Uh, what do you recommend? Uh, what tools do you recommend for delivery plans, e.g. Jira plugins, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera? That's from Tommy. So I'm a huge fan of um, probabilistic forecasting. So thinking about something like Jira, for instance, if you've got um, access to plugins, then anything that's going to let you look at throughput or help think about actually how much stuff you're getting done, that's usually more important than being too focused on stuff like velocity. So using data to inform your forecast is something that I'm a huge fan of. The other thing as well is uh, now, next, later roadmaps. So Jana Basto is the kind of key person who championed that and came up with the idea of now, next, later roadmaps. There's also a really good blog post by Jonathan Smart um, all about kind of how we plan out work and move away from milestones and that kind of fixed scope approach to working. So using something like a now next later roadmap just helps to avoid that early over commitment and really position stuff in a way where it's clear that we're doing the most valuable thing now and then everything past that point could change, but we have our intentions aligned with the vision and aligned with what we want to do. So yeah, for me, really simply use data to indicate how much stuff you're actually getting done. And then try and plan stuff out without, without over committing because the risk there is that you end up delivering something that might not be valuable. Is it fair to say the mindsets need to need to come before the tools? This is not a tool thing, is it, Johnny? Yeah, spot on. I think that's a great point, Jamie, because the risk is that otherwise you're still in that kind of feature factory mindset or the build trap. So uh, there's a great book by Melissa Perry called The Build Trap, which really focuses in on this idea that you can end up just churning stuff out and being fixated on delivering ever increasing scope. But if you're not actually getting to the point of something valuable, there's no point. So I think, as you say, Jamie, that mindset where you're really focused on do the most valuable thing first and then find what's going to be the next course of action is the best way to approach it. Very good. I, I don't know if Tom is in the call, but I hope that answered your question. Maybe you, if you are, you can let us know uh, in, the, in the chat. Uh, here's one from Laura. In terms of ensuring your team is delivering value, how do you as a delivery manager work alongside a product manager so for me that relationship is really key and i come back to that kind of model the tree and verity of teams where you've got that value kind of outcome lead you've got the team outcome lead you've got a technical outcome lead in a lot of teams um personally i think that kind of partnership of thinking about the different roles of enablers is really key so one of the things i like to do something i posted about in fact today on linkedin was thinking about creating like a team canvas or thinking about the responsibilities that might exist in the team to make sure you're not going to be overlapping too strongly because you don't want to be treading on each other's toes. You don't want to be in a, be in a position where the stuff that you're doing is going to block someone else. So I think agreeing what everyone's going to do in the team is a really good thing. Obviously you want that collaboration. You want some healthy overlap, but you don't want to actually get in the way. Um, but I think the kind of key distinction really is that delivery management is more about the enablement of the team, including a product manager, where a product manager might be more focused on the vision, the direction and the value. How are we going to go after value and how can we maximize that value as well? So from a delivery management standpoint, it's really just ensuring that the team can be as effective as possible, which then genuinely tends to fuel the kind of work that a product manager is doing. It, it, it normally should put us in a position where actually product manager can be 10 times more effective because the team is performing in a healthy way and they're not burning out and they know that they've got the right level of work in progress. Brilliant, brilliant. I hope that answers the, um, uh, the question there. Um, how do you encourage, Johnny, the team to constantly look at code and processes through the lens of optimizing for cloud native rather than the hybrid solutions we currently have in place? That's from Dawn. So it's a really interesting question, thinking about that shift in ways of working and thinking about the approach and kind of what we're doing. For me, stuff like retrospectives is really key. And I think there's a danger with retrospectives that they become too focused on like a template that you're using and, and having funny illustrations, all that kind of stuff. But really, that is the domain of continuous improvement more than anything else, is be brutally honest, be completely open, and just really zone in on the idea that we should be looking at what we're doing in the most sort of ruthless way in a lot of contexts. So I think 
posing those questions and using powerful questions is one of the most effective things you can do to ensure that a team is adopting these new approaches and actually reflecting on what their goals are. Because there's a risk, especially when you're trying to go cloud native, that you don't actually implement the changes. And I think actually using stuff like retrospectives and being really focused in on, are we doing the right thing? Are we moving towards our goals? That's how you can ensure that there are those sort of reviews happening. But I also advise trying to coach in practices like extreme programming, thinking about stuff like test driven development, pair programming, and just making sure that you've got that kind of collaborative work that actually is effective for the team to ensure that you've not just got people working in functional silos that mitigates the impact that you can have as you move towards cloud technologies or containers or whatever it might be that's going to enable that kind of effective delivery. You know, I hate retrospective, not, not retrospectives in general, but I was very lucky to meet Norm Kerth, who wrote the original book on software retrospectives and created the Retrospective Prime Directive. Yeah. So many of us, are, it's just a habit, chucking a retro yeah. let's do a debrief, but it's not real failure analysis. You're not really. Okay. And, and, and the thing is, if you look at a team, I simply ask, has this team changed direction in the last 12 months? So for all the retrospectives they've done, have we changed? If you haven't changed direction, it's probably because you haven't learned. I yeah. would say it's better to just not do the retro. Get an hour back or just go to the pub because you'll accidentally spit something out that you'll learn from. And, and, and it's really interesting because there's all these best practices, but as soon as they become best practices, they go from being something useful to something ceremonial. And, and even the best of us can't avoid that. Um, yeah. That's Anyway, that's, sorry, I'm just chucking in no, my right. where... It's a really good point about, because I think that idea that our work is inherently complex. So as soon as we've moved towards the idea that we can apply best practices, we're ignoring that complexity. We have to do what works for us. And I think pub, there's nothing wrong with a good pub retro. And I think that's part of the thing is if you're doing a retro and not changing something, you're probably not actually doing a retro. You're just, I don't know, I'm not sure it's got any point really. Well, no, and Ian, Ian, my colleague, he's a sadomasochist actually, but he's just put in the chat box, retros need to be painful. Actually, <laughs> when we're done with him, that's true. Uh, and there's probably an element of truth in that. And I think the other thing is in, in tech, we're all quite nice and we're all mm. very much into creating inclusive spaces and psychological safe spaces. But sometimes that takes the, sometimes then we tread on eggshells or we go around in circles and, and psychological safety does not mean you don't tackle things head on. Absolutely. I also think there's a poor understanding of what, what does psychological safety look like and if we knew what it looked like, our retros would be better, but we only think we know what it looks like. Yeah, definitely. Right then, let's find, see if there's another question. Um, oh, this is oh, this is quite a good one, actually. This is from Hannah. Um, in an ideal world, what's in and what's out of scope for a delivery manager? Uh, and more, more importantly, how do you manage those expectations for teams? So the fundamental question for me, I really like this question because there's a bunch of stuff like with that gov definition, which feels like, oh, should I really be doing this? For me, the most fundamental question is, is it blocking the team? And that is usually what decides what's in and out of scope in terms of delivery management. So if the team is blocked, then we really need to think about how can we remove that impediment? How can we move past it? And therefore there is probably something that I'm gonna need to do when I'm working within that delivery management context whether that is helping someone in the team see that they can help the problem or whether that is me actually removing the blocker myself and then hopefully bringing back what I've learned and sharing it with the team so we don't find that blocker again. So I look at stuff like um, financial management or some of the commercial stuff that I end up picking up, they're impediments and they're impediments to value, which is why they need to be removed. Um, the other stuff that is like completely in scope, I think one of the challenges is that those three aspects of enablement for me are at the core of what is in scope when you're thinking about delivery management, but it's applying them in the right way. So don't overstep the boundary. You don't have to facilitate every conversation. You don't have to coach every single person individually in the team and certainly don't have to try and become their therapist because that is not what you're there to do. Um, really boiling it down, the scope is being those three aspects of enablement, living it without overstepping the boundary. And that all comes back to what good facilitation looks like most of the time what does the team actually need so start with the question what's the team actually need and that will probably define what is going to be in scope for you to do a lot of the time though one thing i will say is that many challenges around delivery management exist beyond the team so in order for the team to be effective you need to think about the entire system of work apply good systems thinking and think about the interactions that they're having with other people in the organization whether that be teams whether that be managers 
that's kind of where a lot of the, the headaches are going to emerge from. So don't solely look insular. Don't solely look inside the team. Look beyond the team as well, because that's going to be the stuff that usually unlocks most of the team's capability and helps them really be effective. So I've got a question that may or may not be related to my day job running a consultancy. What happens if you bring in a delivery manager practicing? Because I met a, a person yesterday, a very nice person who scaled an awesome professional service company. And they, their, their engineering managers, their line managers used to help run projects. But mm. then they were like, right, we've got to bring in delivery management. Uh, but when they did, the old leaders of the project actually felt pushed out, elbowed out. And, and there was a bit of a power struggle. Have you ever witnessed that, Johnny? Yeah, definitely. I think it, it's really interesting if you do try and when organizations just inject something like that, it's really challenging and can be very confrontational. And it's one of the reasons whenever I land with a new team, I always try and take the back seat. I'm not there to rock up and be like, right, what am I going to change? What's broken? How are we going to fix all of the stuff that has been a headache? Because half the time a team doesn't want that. So I think that's kind of the same with organizational change, that if you're going to try and deploy a new discipline or you're going to try and deploy a new role, you need to ensure that that starts with the back seat and starts with small scale experimentation. For me, equally, it's this aspect of like, how do you de-risk some of these decisions? So when it comes to something like starting out with delivery management, try it once, see how it works, see what the headaches are, and then build out from there. Don't go wholesale with change, because if there's anything that kills change, it's that kind of wholesale, we're going to do everything all at once, like with big agile transformations. I've been involved in enough of those to see all of the things that cause them to fail. And most of the time, it's trying to do it all in one big bang. It just does not work. It's a very old way of thinking about change as well. So we are bringing in a delivery management practice now. We're all super excited because we're just full transparency now. I mean, we're not recording this, right? So, <laughs> full transparency. so we, we're scaling, Johnny. So we're now 110 people and we're hitting all those traditional sort of bumps. And recently, John joined as our VP of engineering and Kate joined as our COO. And as soon as they arrived, they both said straight away, we need delivery managers. So we're now <laughs> building that capability up. And I actually just went onto the job site so I could share the link. But the job's been closed, which makes me think we've probably got enough candidates. So I'm fingers sure. crossed we're going to have a delivery. The difference is, is no, there's been no power struggle at like Container Solutions because yeah. it's a really difficult job. And we're crying yeah. out for professionals to come in and sort of help us out and help us deliver better uh, value and service to our customers. Amazing. We, we already deliver very, very good service. Of course, of course. Of course. It's just an accelerator. Um, it's a multiplier. This is, just, this is next level stuff. <laughs> um, right. We've got, a, we've got actually, we've got a question. Uh, I think this is from, from our VP of engineering, John. With Git analysis tools like Pluralsight Flow and Haystack becoming more popular, is delivery management becoming more technical as a discipline? That is a really fascinating question. I think, so I often like to lean into this idea that delivery management by default is technical anyway, but might not always be technological. So that distinction between technical and technological is quite an important one because some of the technical stuff that I do, for instance, like Monte Carlo simulations or some of the things that I've done around um, even formulating a workshop, you have to understand the dynamics between people and you have to understand how certain tools and techniques that you might bring to the table are going to impact others. And equally, a lot of the reading that we do is related to um, behavioral psychology or understanding stuff like Conway's law and having that concept around socio-technical architecture or socio-technical practices. So there's a high degree of, I think, technical awareness that has to exist. Like if you're applying systems thinking, even something like team topologies, for instance, means you need to know enough about technical stuff that you can apply these ideas effectively. Where it starts leaning more into a technological discipline and expands upon those technical ideas, I think there is an exposure to this stuff, which in some ways, harking back to the, the gossip around ChatGPT, it's almost like there's an abstraction of some of these things, which makes the technical side of the work easier to consume, but therefore the theoretical understanding that you need to have has to be richer and deeper so you can really make the most of it. So when you're looking at these like analysis tools, for instance, when you're getting an awareness of what's actually happening in the code, what the tools are doing, I think this aligns with the movement towards socio-technical roles and socio-technical knowledge, where the two are intrinsically linked and we can't simply look at the tech and think it won't work without the people, but you can't look at the people and think they can deliver value without having a good understanding of the tech. So in terms of is delivery management becoming a more technical discipline, I think that any effective person who's trying to apply delivery management should really be embracing 
the kind of technological awareness that they need. It, it's a really valuable thing to deepen that knowledge, even from a theoretical standpoint. You don't have to be hands on keyboard, but get a sense. I know recently, so I've been reading um, Clean Agile and Clean Architecture because for me personally, the more that I understand architecture, the more effective I can be at calling out stuff like Conway's Law, where the way that the teams are structured has an impact on the system that we build. So personally, I would always advocate, even at a really theoretical level, have a deeper understanding of the tech. And when you're thinking about code analysis tools, or you're thinking about stuff like Git analysis, which is a great example, it all comes back to interaction patterns. It all comes back to um, how people work, because the code really mirrors the people, and the people end up mirroring the code. So hopefully that answers that, John, but it's a really interesting question. And I think it's kind of more of this stuff will become abstracted, but it means the bit that isn't abstracted, you need to understand in even greater depth so you can make the best of the stuff that is abstracted. I hate it when people somehow think management is not a technical discipline. Like there are, <laughs> there's, you know, it's like being a dentist or an accountant. There are things you can learn and you can apply and you can improve. There's, there's not, nothing magical. Now, I think we're, we're coming close to the end of time. So I think we've got time for one more question. Does that work for you? I'll just check with Carla and Jamie. Thumbs up on one more question. Yes. Okay, John, are you okay to go for one more awesome. question? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, right, let me... Let me Oh, here we go. Da, 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 da. Is PMO dead? And if it's not dead, where do they sit in the value tech team triumvirate, if I've said that word right? Yeah, yeah, nailed it. Um, so there is a really good video um, titled The PMO is Dead, Long Live the PMO. And that, once again, he's got a good few call outs. I hope I get some sort of commission off John Smart at some point, but Jonathan Smart has was recorded that video. Um, and the idea in that that I really relate to is this idea of having value enablement teams instead. So pivoting that kind of idea of a PMO, which traditionally has been very oriented around more command and control kind of capability, being around that kind of discipline of, we're gonna be, be the people who set standards, tell you what you're doing and position you in the places so that you can actually operate shifting that towards being more explicitly around enablement i think is really important and actually a good use of that kind of pmo capability so if you've got these people whose pmo skill set is around coordination supporting the people that work in an organization to know what they're doing and have that visibility i think that actually you're really well placed to pivot towards value enablement which really is about a larger scale discipline of removing impediments, making sure that people know what's going on, helping with visualization, and especially in a remote world, when we're thinking about engineers spread out across the entire world trying to deliver value on these products that are most times complex, you can't do the stuff that we used to do in person around like walk the walls or look at a Kanban board and some team's space or whiteboard, however they were structured. So a PMO actually, if they change function slightly, could be the really instrumental people who remove that burden from a team of making sure that people know what's happening, that people know what's going on, whether that is creating some or cultivating a kind of virtual Miro space that enables people to walk the walls or whether it's being the people that go along to sprint reviews and sort of capturing the information that exists in, in that format and making sure that other people can access it. I think there is a role for those people. And much like I say in the book about project management, there are still these disciplines still have value. It's just that they might not be the right disciplines for the kind of self organizing, empowered teams that we really want to see so that they can own and run product. But they might fit in somewhere else. And I think each organization is unique and has to make those decisions. But there's usually a place. Very good. On that note, it's time to wrap up this webinar. So I actually thought a lot of the questions were really very sensible today. Sometimes we get some bonkers. <laughs> And then I have to decide, am I asking them or am I not asking them? So thank you very much. So let's just let's just wrap up with a few more announcements and a few thank yous. So first of all, I see my colleague Maggie's on this call. Maggie, I booked my flights to Canada. So if anybody, if anybody is in Canada and wants to meet me, I'm going to be there in the week of the 8th, hanging out in Toronto Monday, Tuesday, and then Montreal uh, Wednesday, Thursday. I did see a few people who dialed, there was, there was a group earlier who dialed in from a board meeting, a board room together. I hope they had a good experience. I didn't mean to pick on them in the beginning, uh, but we hope you've enjoyed this and any other people who are struggling with cloud native or delivery management. Hello, thank you for putting your camera back on. Uh, we hope you've enjoyed it. Please send us some feedback. We do listen to all feedback and we're always looking to improve. 
Container Solutions are awesome at what we do. We're brilliant engineers. We're the best in the business when it comes to getting stuff to the cloud and helping customers learn. If you need any help, give us a call. There's a very good chance you'll meet our new delivery manager on the, on the pre-sales call. Don't forget the conference next week, right? The, this, the WTF is a community, right? We don't, it, it's really more about helping the community. It doesn't really work too well as a, as a sales tool, but if you're interested in all of the work we've been doing, come to the conference, keep your eye out for the next webinars. There's lots of stuff coming up and subscribe to the newsletter. There's not gonna be one next month, but something will, will come back later. And on that note then, it's the thank you. So thank you to all of you for attending and asking sensible questions. And for those of you who switched your videos on, that was very nice. Uh, thank you to my team from Container Solutions, which is Jamie, Carl, and Teresa. But Teresa's not here today, I don't think. She's usually our... She's hiding somewhere. She's yeah, hiding. Oh, there she is. is. So there she is. Hey, Teresa. So thank you to the events team, Carla, Jamie, uh, and Teresa. Thank you to me for awesome facilitation. Ooh. Round of applause. But the biggest round of applause uh, is for Johnny for coming kicking ass with this talk and really entertaining us today. So thank you, Johnny. Good thank stuff. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Johnny. Thank you. Thank you. We all. will see you all at the next webinars. We wish you happy Thursdays and happy Fridays tomorrow. Take care of each other. It's a very strange time in the economy right now. And we'll see you next time. Bye. Thank you all.